Okay, I'm gonna start broadcasting, so get ready. Okay. Good evening, we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. Good evening, we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. Good evening, we'll get started in just a moment. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, Prostate Cancer and Treatment Options, presented by Dr. Jeffrey Nooner. Dr. Nooner will take questions after his presentation. Please submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We welcome your questions. Dr. Nooner is a radiation oncologist who has been practicing since 2011. He practices at the Greater Baltimore Medical Center and also works with Chesapeake Urology patients. He earned his medical degree from Eastern Virginia Medical School, where he completed his internship in internal medicine. He completed his residency in radiation oncology at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Dr. Nima practices in Chesapeake Urology's Quarry Lake office in Baltimore. He delivers external beam radiation and performs repeat therapy procedures. Welcome, Dr. Nooner. Thank you. Good evening to all of you out there. Uh, it's my pleasure to do this webinar tonight and um, hopefully inform you a little bit uh, better about options for prostate cancer. Um, I'm just going to go through the slide with me in a younger phase. Um, so tonight, um, you know, first I want to give a prostate cancer overview, talk about the anatomy, um, statistics of prostate cancer, how the diagnosis is made, uh, and then treatment options, uh, and then delve into radiation treatment options a little bit further. Uh, and then I'd like to talk about space or hydrogel, uh, which we use to mitigate uh, some of the toxicity of radiation. So the prostate is located um, beneath the bladder and uh, anterior to the rectum. Um, it has several functions. It, it actually works as a, uh, probably unintentionally as a back pressure valve for the bladder. Um, it also uh, works to um, mix uh, seminal fluid with sperm and uh, eject it out of the penis. Um, and its relationship to the bladder and the rectum, uh, as well as the urethra and the penis, is how uh, patients uh, can get toxicity from the treatments that we have for prostate cancer. About one man in nine will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Uh, and it is the second leading cause of cancer death in American men uh, 
right behind lung cancer. Um, so in the United States in 2018, there were uh, approximately 165,000 cases uh, and there were 29,000 deaths from prostate cancer. Um, so all of those statistics um, are relatively frightful, but actually for localized prostate cancer, uh, which are the majority of prostate cancers, the survival rate um, at five and uh, 10 years is uh, quite high um, for, uh, even for all stages, the five-year survival rate is 99%, and at 10 years, it's 98%. Um, so if you look at those numbers, um, what that conveys is that the cancer itself is quite treatable, um, and even uh, after spreading, uh, it can be treated for quite a number of years. Um, the goal of treating localized prostate cancer besides preventing prostate cancer death and spread of prostate cancer causing um, pain in the bones and things like that is also to keep patients off of lifelong treatment. So how do we diagnose prostate cancer? Most patients are um, biopsied because uh, they are screened with a PSA and that comes back elevated. Some patients, a prostate nodule is detected on digital rectal exam. Um, and over the years, the guidelines for screening have changed somewhat. Uh, for a long time, uh, the recommend, recommendation was that all men over 50 uh, receive yearly PSA screening. That went um, a different way where um, there was a, a big movement against PSA screening and now it has become more individualized based on um, the patient's desires for screening as well as family history and a more uh, personalized um, 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 talk with the um, patient's primary physician. There are cancers that are detected um, outside of screening and that's when a patient is diagnosed uh, because they come in with urinary symptoms uh, such as obstruction or pain or bleeding. Uh, but that is actually less common. Um, and ultimately, the only way to diagnose this cancer is by getting prostatic tissue which shows cancer, and that is by and large performed uh, through a prostate biopsy. Uh, some men do incidentally have prostate cancer found if they have a procedure to open up the middle of the prostate, uh, but that is relatively uncommon. Uh, prostate biopsies can be done in one of two ways. Um, most of the time they're done using the approach on the right, which is a transrectal approach, uh, and that is guided by an ultrasound imaging. However, uh, they can also be done uh, via a transperineal approach where you uh, put the needle through the skin behind the scrotum. Um, and either one, ha uh, either approach has its um, uh, particular benefits and risks. So the way we grade um, risk stratify and stage prostate cancer is based on um, the Gleason score, which is the way the cells look under the microscope, uh, the T stage, which is the way the prostate feels on the clinical uh, digital rectal exam, and the PSA. Um, these three things help us delineate um, where patients sit in terms of staging and risk grouping, but also what kind of treatment they may need. Uh, to um, give them the highest chance of getting rid of their cancer. There are also other things that we use uh, to, to help us better understand the aggressiveness of the cancer. Uh, one is PSA velocity. That means how quickly the PSA is rate, uh, rising over time. Um, nowadays, there's genomic testing, which we um, look at quite a bit for patients who have um, 
disease that is potentially amenable to what's called active surveillance. Uh, and essentially that is looking at the genetic expression of their cancers and comparing that expression to the expression of cancers of men where we know what happened to them in relation to their cancer. And then trying to predict how those patients might do. Um, the volume of tumor uh, sometimes gives us an indication of um, how aggressive uh, the, the cancer might be. A lot of times we can see that through an MRI. And then there are other um, model, risk models and labs that can be utilized. So the most common treatment options, if you look at our national guidelines for prostate, ca prostate cancer, are radiation therapy, surgery, and active surveillance. Um, and active surveillance is not a treatment option, it is a management option. Um, and it is primarily, primarily used for low risk and low intermediate risk patients, patients we call favorable intermediate risk. Um, when you get into these different treatment options, there are various ways of delivering them. So prostatectomy, which is the oldest uh, surgical option can be delivered uh, via radical prostatectomy or laparoscopic radical prostatectomy or robot assisted laparoscopic radical prostatectomy. Radiation therapy traditionally was delivered using something called 3D conformal radiation therapy. Uh, by and large most um, people now use either intensity modulated radiotherapy or stereotactic body radiotherapy or they do what's called brachytherapy. Brachy is the Greek um, uh, word for near, so it means putting something near the cancer. Um, and that comes in both uh, uh, low-dose rate and high-dose rate brachytherapy, which I will go into later. The newest radiation modality is proton therapy, which is a form of what we call external beam therapy which again, like intensity modulated radiation and stereotactic body radiation, is radiation delivered from externally from a machine. Um, active surveillance is a management option for those patients that have very slow growing cancers um, who might never need treatment for their cancers. Uh, and so that consists of getting a PSA every six to 12 months, a biopsy every one to three years, maybe an MRI to guide the biopsy. And it has proven in clinical trials to be um, equivalent to immediate treatment in terms of survival for appropriately selected patients. Radiation therapy and surgery both can affect the bowel function, urinary function, and sexual function of patients. Uh, and active surveillance aims to avoid side effects uh, from those treatments to those uh, bodily functions. So getting, um, going into radiation treatment a little bit uh, further, uh, this is a schematic of what a linear accelerator looks like. It's a big x-ray machine. Uh, and by and large, most of the radiation delivered throughout the world for therapeutic purposes is x-ray treatment. Um, so high energy x-rays, what they do is they cause DNA damage, which then causes chromosomal damage. Um, and that chromosomal damage is less easily repaired in cancer cells. So once the cancer cells go to reproduce, they die. And that is essentially how radiation works to kill cancer. Because your normal tissues have a better capacity to repair radiation damage, they can heal the um, radiation damage that occurs to some extent. Um, and that's how we get this differential effect of radiation on the cancer versus radiation on your normal tissue. Despite that, you can still get side effects from radiation. 
Um, and given where the prostate is, you can get bowel dysfunction, uh, which could be um, associated with diarrhea, blood in the stool, and even rectal leakage. Uh, there could also be urinary dysfunction, which means the need to urinate more often, having a burning sensation when you urinate, blood in your urine, uh, or even urinary incontinence because of urgency to get to the bathroom. Um, we did go over this, the types of ther um, external beam radiation, so 3D conformal radiation, which we don't really use much for prostate cancer, uh, definitive treatment of prostate cancer, intensity modulated radiation, and um, stereotactic body radiotherapy are both ways of delivering radiation to a target within the body where you have um, organs around that you want to avoid. And you basically have multiple windows through which you can deliver the radiation. And as, as the beam angles are going around the target, those windows are moving in and out so that the target is painted with a nice dose of radiation while avoiding the organs nearby. Um, image guided radiation is typically used when using either uh, intensity modulated radiation or stereotactic body radiation. And that simply means that we use either x-rays or CT scans on the machine to line up the prostate where it was when we did the treatment planning. Proton therapy is a charged particle therapy <clears throat> that based on the energy of the proton, it will give off all of its radiation energy at a specific depth in tissue and very little radiation goes beyond that target. Um, there are uh, potential benefits for proton therapy in certain body sites um, but at this time, there's no data to suggest that it's any more effective um, than x-ray therapy for prostate cancer. However, there are randomized trials currently being done to determine if that's the case. Um, there's what we call internal radiation therapy or brachytherapy, and that is the placement of radioactive sources next to the cancer. So low-dose rate brachytherapy is a way of putting permanent uh, capsules filled with a radioactive substance into the prostate. Those capsules can give off their radiation over a period of six weeks to six months uh, to kill the cancer. Uh, they then become inert and stay there permanently. Um, high dose rate brachytherapy is given by placing catheters into the prostate doing a treatment plan and then having a machine put a small radioactive source at different depths of these catheters uh, for a period of time and then removing the catheters. Both of those are considered reasonable options uh, for prostate cancer treatment as well. The problem with radiation, and this goes both for external beam radiation and internal radiation or brachytherapy is that these organs are nearby. So you can see this starting with this blue cloud and then going to green and then yellow, orange, red. These are dose gradients. So the blue is a lower dose and then higher dose and then higher dose. Right here is the, um, in the yellow outline is the rectum. Right here in the red is the prostate. The prostate moves around quite a bit in the body, or at least we have to account for that motion when patients are getting treated because we know during a treatment course or between treatments, it does have some significant movement. And so if we don't account for that motion, we will miss the prostate and thereby miss the cancer. So what we do is we draw the prostate and then we add a safety margin to account for prostate related motion. Well, that safety margin back here will go right into the anterior rectal wall. And you can see that high dose radiation is skimming the anterior rectal wall. It also goes into the bladder. Um, it obviously 
the urethra, which goes right down through the middle of the prostate, gets full dose radiation. And then below the prostate, there's the penile bulb, which has been implicated in sexual dysfunction due to radiation. Um, one of the you know, most well-known uh, consequences of radiation is rectal toxicity. During treatment, most patients get some degree of rectal irritation. I mean, they go to the bathroom more frequently, urgently, um, maybe have loose stools, um, diarrhea. By and large, after radiation, that goes away. In the long run, however, there can be anywhere from a 1 in 20 to 1 in 10 uh, chance of getting rectal bleeding. Now, that rectal bleeding is typically like hemorrhoidal bleeding. You have a hard bowel movement or multiple bowel movements in the day and you get a little blood on your toilet tissue. Occasionally it can be severe where you're oozing blood out of the rectum and that requires um, intervention using um, a, a laser or something similar. Um, so this has been a long time issue for radiation oncologists and we've done everything we can to prevent it including the changing of the um, radiation regimen from 3D conformal to IMRT and SBRT, but patients still get rectal toxicity. As you can see in this retrospective paper, um, without any kind of intervention, 6% of patients have late rectal toxicity with high dose radiation um, hitting the anterior rectal wall. In addition, we can see up to 32% of patients can have um, late urinary toxicity. Um, this is typically higher than what I quote, actually, but uh, this is for a, re a dose regimen that I don't typically use. Um, but it's, um, it's, a, it's a real phenomenon where we have room for improvement. One of the things that we can do to reduce rectal and even urinary or even sexual um, uh, toxicity is something called space ore. You can see in this paper that by the application of space ore, you can bring the toxicity rate from 6% down to 1%. So what is space ore? Um, we know that we're going to treat the rectum to a high dose most of the time and that the prostate is in close proximity to the uh, rectum. There's also movement of the prostate. So even though we might do a nice plan where the dose is, um, you know, right hugging the posterior uh, prostatic volume, if there's movement anterior of the rectum, more of the rectum will be in the radiation field. So the rectum is the organ at risk and we want to avoid the bleeding, frequency, urgency, pain, um, and um, even the most severe things such as fistulas. So what we do is we temporary we put in a temporary buffer, which is called space ore, and it's basically a hydrogel, which is completely resorbable by the body, and this tends to push the rectum back anywhere from um, seven millimeters to one and a half centimeters. Um, and essentially the high dose radiation represented here in red will end up going through the gel instead of going through the anterior rectal wall. After about six months, this hydrogel is completely broken down by the body and removed through the urine as other waste products are. The hydrogel is inserted in an outpatient procedure um, and it is relatively uh, uh, toxicity free. There are case reports of rectal perforations and things like this, but those are extremely rare um, and we have had none of those in our practice. Just some facts about uh, the hydrogel. Um, it's synthetic but biocompatible and it's non-toxic. As I said, it absorbs in about six months, and it's mostly, mostly made of water and uh, polyethylene glycol, or PEG, and PEG is used in multiple medical products, 
um, artificial tears, prescription drugs, medical implants. Um, we actually use it a lot in the oncology world to bind drugs so they have better specificity for targets. Um, it's a, as I said, a brief outpatient procedure. Uh, typically it's done under local or regional anesthesia, although it can be done under general anesthesia. Um, and it, it's designed, as I said, to provide that space between the rectum and the prostate um, to reduce high dose radiation to the rectum. Um, in a clinical trial that was done to study it, um, randomized clinical trial, the, the patients that did not get it were eight times more likely to have a decline in bowel, urinary, and sexual quality of life when compared to space or hydrogel patients at three years. Um, and you know, we actually have found that very interesting. It was obviously made to reduce rectal side effects, but yet we saw these differences in sexual and urinary side effects. We're not totally sure we understand that, um, but we'll take the improvement nonetheless. So, you know, if we get more space in there, the rectal, urinary, and sexual complications go down, uh, and this does result in a better quality of life for our patients. And again, we're looking at patients um, we're looking to cure patients and we're looking for them to have a long, you know, life on the planet. So we do not want to induce any permanent side effects. Um, in terms of space or there have now been over 75 peer reviewed publications. Um, you know, it's used all over the place. It's reimbursed uh, both by Medicare and private insurance companies. 50,000 patients have been treated worldwide. So uh, we're very comfortable with the administration of it. Um, and that's the end of my talk, fairly quick. So I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Nooner. Everyone, please submit your questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll be happy to take those questions. Dr. Nooner, our first question. What factors influence the judgment whether external radiation or brachytherapy will work better for a given patient? So that's a great question. Um, and it's, to be honest with you, the brachytherapy is a great treatment because it's, you know, one and done treatment, uh, but it is potentially more toxic, slightly more toxic to the urinary system. And um, so we do look at patients in terms of their prostate size and their baseline urinary function. Um, so if they have a prostate that's greater than um, 50 cc's, uh, cubic centimeters. Um, definitely if it's greater than 60 cc's, we tend to shy away from the brachytherapy procedure or we ask the patient to take a medicine to shrink the prostate um, to get it down in size to, to enable the procedure. Um, also, if their baseline urinary function is very poor, um, we get worried that you know, the brachytherapy will set them off in a bad way. But that's typically what we're looking at in that case is whether or not they have obstruction. So some men have um, urinary symptoms due to their bladder being very hyperactive. And some men have symptoms because their prostate is blocking the outflow. If the prostate is blocking the outflow and we do brachytherapy, um, they could, um, you know, become completely obstructed, require long-term catheter. Uh, and so that's what goes into it. Now, for high risk or unfavorable intermediate risk patients, there has been one clinical trial which has shown an advantage to using brachytherapy um, over external beam alone. So for those patients, it's kind of a different paradigm. They, they get hormone therapy in addition to radiation, which we 
haven't talked about tonight. Um, but hormone therapy to reduce their testosterone, external beam radiation, and they could get a radioactive seed implant after a short course of external beam radiation, or they could just get a full course of external beam radiation. The one clinical trial that compared those two options showed about a 20% difference in PSA control at 10 years with the radioactive seed approach. So sometimes we'll have a patient who, you know, maybe their urinary function is marginal, but they have high risk disease. We'll ask the urologist, hey, can you do anything about the the urinary function beforehand, maybe we can do a brachytherapy procedure because it might be very useful for this patient. In all of our patients, you know, I think in the past, we have been very quick to apply our radiation treatments because they had cancer and we had to get it going. But, you know, over the past 20, 30 years, we've realized that as these cancers are slow growing, we have time to do things like optimize the patient's urinary function before giving radiation, because it's more difficult to do that after radiation. So we definitely want to evaluate the patient's urinary function first. If there's anything that can be done ahead of radiation, regardless of what modality we use, uh, we want to look into that to help the patient in the long run. Thank you. Are the risk factors using space or gel similar to those for a surgical treatment? Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm gonna answer your question correctly, but I'll try. Um, the big side effects of surgery do not tend to involve the rectum, so that is that is the number one difference between radiation and surgery. Surgery typically, you know, most patients wake up and they cannot control the urination and they have no erectile function. Most patients get back their urinary control within two to six months. And, you know, at least in clinical trials of post-operative radiation that I've looked at recently, you know, long-term incontinence from surgery is as low as 4%, which is excellent. Um, sexual function can take up to two years to come back. A lot of that depends on um, what the sexual function was going into surgery and whether or not they had to take a nerve on one side of the prostate or both sides of the prostate. Um, there is data showing long in the long run, three to five years out from whatever treatment you do, that you know the outcomes for sexual function are similar to the outcomes um, for radiation-based treatments. In terms of the rectum, you know it's relatively rare to get a rectal injury from surgery. Um, however, as you can see in that one paper, you know with the use of space or the the rate of a rectal injury uh, after radiation. And again, these are manageable rectal injuries, but still, uh, the rate was less, was around 1%. And that's what was shown in the um, clinical trial that was done to um, get space or approved. Dr. Nina, there are uh, many questions about how the radiation affects the ureter or the urethra and, you know, how or if the space or gel can be used for that as well. Yeah, so the urethra, um, um, it, so first of all, the space or gel cannot be used for it. Um, there's really no great space to put the gel in around the urethra, uh, you know, uh, and if you take out a prostate and you slice it up and look at it under the microscope, there are cells, cancer cells all over it. And that's why we don't typically um, do uh, like local treatment in the prostate, except for very, very, very 
low risk disease where we can see a lesion on the MRI. Um, so when we radiate a prostate, we have to radiate the entire prostate. The, typically though, patients do not get into trouble um, from urethral injuries. They typically get into trouble either because the bladder um, um, was damaged from radiation and, and lost its ability to hold urine. And so you, you can't wait as long to go pee and you have to go pee more often. Um, there are times with brachytherapy that you can get, you know, if you don't do the implant right, um, you get a hot spot in the urethra and then you get a scar in the urethra. Um, but that's more of, you know, that's more of an issue of technique and doing the procedure correctly. Um, but there's no great way that we know of right now to spare the urethra from radiation. Thank you. Can you please provide a timeline of hormone therapy and radiation and brachytherapy treatment plans? Yeah, so typically- What comes first, second, third, and what's Oh yeah, so of? typically yeah. hormone therapy is administered first. Uh, that gives, that gives um, time for the hormones to work on the cancer and sort of shut it down, make it quiescent. It also gives time to downsize the prostate if we need that. Um, so sometimes if a patient has a very large prostate, instead of giving them two months of hormones, we will give them, you know, four to six months of hormones to get more time to get shrinkage. Um, and that's totally safe. We have data showing um, that, you know, we can give hormones out eight months to a year and the patients are fine. There's no progression of disease outside of the hormone um, effect. So typically we start the hormones first, then we do the prep work for the radiation about one month in, um, and then we plan to start the radiation around two months into the hormone treatment. Then the radiation goes for about five weeks, uh, and then a week or two after that, uh, we take the patient to the operating room to put in the radioactive seeds. Thank you. Does the gel affect the dose of radiation delivered to the prostate? No. No. The dose of the dose of radiation delivered to the prostate will be the same. When was space or first used by Chesapeake Urology and how new of a therapy is this? Good question. So one of our other radiation oncologists was actually on the trial. So, you know, our, you know, collectively in the, in the company, um, we've had involvement for this for, with this for over five years. Uh, the program itself um, really got up and running, I think about two years ago. Uh, and that was largely based on insurance coverage because once the, once the trial was done, uh, it had to be reported. Um, the, the outcomes were, I think, at three years. But you, know, you have to wait for the outcomes to get reported, and then you have to go to the FDA and get approval. And then you know, the local Medicare approval commission has to say whether or not they're going to pay for this to be done. So that basically happened about two years ago, I think. There are a lot of questions about pre-existing conditions aside from prostate cancer that would decide whether or not a person would be a candidate for using the space or gel. Can you address that, please? Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, if there's been a previous rectal injury, a previous fistula, um, um, you know, any kind of anatomic abnormality that might prevent it, um, those are things where we would probably steer clear of using it. Um, you know, if there's been any surgery, basically the way, you know, and I don't, I don't want to um, simplify surgery too much, but, you know, 
if you've ever worked with meat, there's silver skin on meat, and the, that, the, that tissue is kind of what surgeons use to separate organs out in the body and take them out cleanly. Um, if you've ever had you know, a surgery or a rectal injury, um, that could obliterate those tissue planes, and we use those tissue planes to get the gel in between the prostate and the rectum. There's a virtual space there um, so what you do when you do the procedure, a needle goes up through the skin behind the scrotum into this space and you inject some saline to, to open up that space some and also to confirm you're in it. Once you've confirmed you're, you're in it and you've opened it up, then the gel goes in. But if there's been some kind of injury either through surgery or a, um, you know, a, a medical problem, you know, that, that might not, um, that might not work or, you know, if we try that, we might injure the patient. On the flip side, you know, for a long time with radiation patients, we have these relative contraindications of inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease or um, ulcerative colitis, where we were really loath to give radiation um, because of a risk of setting off a, a, a flare. And those patients were actually much more excited to use space or um, we think we can more safely treat them now. Thank you. Is space or used in post prostatectomy salvage radiation treatment? That's a great question. Um, so it's not. And um, again, that's because the patients had surgery. And so there's usually, you know, that space where the prostate was has adhered to the anterior rectal um, tissue. Um, but also because in post-prostatectomy treatment, the, um, you know, that tissue that's all the way up against the rectum is at risk for the recurrence. So it has to be treated. The difference between post-prostatectomy and intact prostate treatment is that the dose we use is lower. And so in radiation, um, there's a very, what we call a sigmoidal dose curve. So basically you don't get side effects, you don't get side effects, and then within a very uh, narrow dose range, the side effects go up exponentially, and then almost everyone gets them after a certain dose. So because that dose we use for post-prostatectomy is lower, there's a much lower incidence of rectal injury. So it appears that we have a good number of people who have been diagnosed and are trying to make the decision of which type of treatment they should take between surgery versus um, radiation. And they, they're asking a lot of questions about how that decision gets made and what are some of the factors that should be considered. Sure. Uh, it's a very difficult decision. Um, you know, if, I, if there are no surgeons on the uh, webinar, I would say go straight to radiation. But of course, that's not the case. Um, you know, we don't have great comparative data. Unfortunately, as you saw, it's a very common cancer, but we have not been able to accrue to clinical trials to compare these, um, these treatments. So, um, you know, here are specific situations. Very, very young patients traditionally have been treated with surgery. Um, is there data to give them radiation? And when I say very, very young patients, I'm talking about patients less than the age of, say, 55. Um, that was done really because they have such a long life ahead of them, um, you know, and there's a possibility that they may develop a, another prostate cancer down the road after radiation. But is there data to show that they are well treated with radiation? There is. So, even that is questionable, but I think there's still that bias. Um, one group of patients where I'm always, um, I'm, I, I'm always um, considering surgery to be a better option is if they have 
a very large obstructing prostate um, and the surgeon thinks that they can uh, alleviate uh, urinary symptoms by getting it out of the way. I think that's a very reasonable indication for doing surgery. Um, you know, in terms of higher risk disease, um, there's some data saying you have to give maximal therapy. Uh, so that, inclu that includes surgery followed by radiation or hormones, radiation, and radioactive seeds. But again, those aren't comparative data. Um, uh, so we really just don't know. Um, so, you know, in the past, we looked at things like ulcerative colitis and um, um, other inflammatory bowel disease as a reason not to get radiation. If you look at quality of life studies, uh, short-term quality of life tends to be better after radiation-based modalities. Why is that? Because humans don't like immediate changes in their lives. And surgery gives you a very immediate change. If you look three to five years out though, quality of life, regardless of what treatment you get, kind of approaches each other. There's more incontinence-based issues with the surgery people, but there's more irritated urinary issues with the radiation-based uh, uh, patients. So in the end, patients accommodate the changes that have happened. Um, and you know, what you could see from the data we presented, the long-term, the risks of long-term toxicity are actually quite low. I'm sure that didn't help anyone. I'm sorry. This goes along with that question, but please explain the pros and cons of proton therapy. Um, so the, it's a, it's a great question. It gets asked over and over. There is no defined benefit that we know of right now for proton therapy, except that um, there's less scatter dose into the rest of the body. Um, and that typically means that, um, you know, or potentially oh, that means uh, that there's um, a lower chance of developing a second malignancy. Now, has that been borne out in data? Have we seen that? No. Um, is there any difference in rectal or bladder toxicity between protons and photons? Not that we know of. The papers that have been published show equivalency. Um, so at this point, our national radiation oncology um, 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 organization essentially says you shouldn't be treated for prostate cancer with protons unless it's under the guise of a clinical trial. Can you say if age or having a hip implant are impediments to having space or and radiation? Can you say that again? Um, are age and or advanced age, I should say, are advanced age and having a hip replacement implant uh, impediment to having radiation treatment? No. In fact, in my practice, I think the patients that deal the, deal the most with things like fecal um, leakage and fecal urgency tend to be the older patients. Um, so, I, you know, they're, they're at just as much of a risk of rectal complications, if not more risk, than younger patients. Um, uh, a hip prosthesis doesn't doesn't impact space or uh, placement at all, unless you know the patient has like a frozen hip where they can't get their their leg up into stirrups to do the procedure. Um, and in fact, we use MRIs on those patients because we often cannot see the um, the prostate because of uh, scatter from the hip prosthesis. There's a question about the seeds and how long someone who has, has implant seeds. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Um, 
patients who have had seeds implanted, the radioactive seeds? I'm sorry, hold on just one second. Sure. Sorry about that. It's okay. late in the office. Yeah. Um, yes, there's a few questions about seed implants and having radiation with those, and also how long you have to stay away from young children when you have those implants. I'm sorry, you have to say that again, please. Um, there's a couple questions about um, radioactive seed implants, prostate yeah. cancer, and they're asking um, if you had those implants, can you still have radiation treatment uh, and the space or gel? And also, how long must you stay away from young children? Okay. Um, so, after a radioactive seed implant, you're considered radioactive for six months. Um, you know, we do everything we can to limit radiation exposure to patients and, 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 and people that are near them. So, you know, we don't want children sitting on your lap or under your arm watching TV. But the radiation exposure to someone who's sitting next to you at the dinner table or next to you in the car would be minimal. Um, we don't want anyone within an arm's length for more than 20 minutes a day. So, um, you know, loved ones can come up, give you a hug, kiss. Um, after the radioactive seed implant, you can have sex. You just can't have sex for hours at a time. Typically, we ask you to wear a condom uh, for the first three um, 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 episodes of intercourse. Um, and that's about it. So the, you know, the restrictions are there. They're not, um, they're not onerous. Uh, we do have patients who help take care of their kids or grandkids. Um, and in those cases, they may feel more comfortable getting something called rad guard, which is a, it's almost like a leaded undergarment with blocks, you know, almost everything coming out of their pelvis. Um, if you do get a radioactive seed implant, I think the, I didn't quite hear this part, but I think the question was, could you have radiation in the future? Um, and, you know, it, de it depends on what's going on. But if there's a failure because of the radioactive seed implant, one of the salvage options is to give external beam radiation. Another salvage option is to give radioactive seeds again. Another salvage option is to do the high dose rate brachy therapy. Um, and then in terms of other places in your body, you know, God forbid, um, a lung cancer developed five years down the road, there's no impact of the radiation that was delivered to the pelvis on that. Okay, we have several questions relating to um, gentlemen who've had surgery to remove their prostate uh, or part of their prostate and their cancer has returned. They're asking, are they able to now have radiation therapy? So it depends. So what we do in that situation is we try and figure out where the PSA is coming from. So typically, we don't see a cancer on imaging when that happens. We just see PSA on a blood test. Uh, so the process there is that we go, um, we do imaging. Um, traditionally, that would be a CT and a bone scan, um, but we nowadays use what are called PET scans, which um, use a, um, a substance that um, localizes to where prostate cancer cells are, hopefully, and then emits radiation that's picked up by a detector and then co-localizes it on a CT scan done at the same time. If we see where the PSA is coming from, um, if it's coming from where the prostate was or a lymph node in the pelvis, 
then we offer radiation, um, often with hormonal therapy. If we see that it's coming from um, bone, the bones, uh, which is the most like, likely place outside of the pelvis for prostate cancer to spread, then it really depends. In the old days, we would say, well, you know, you're gonna get hormonal therapy and some advanced hormonal therapy. Nowadays, there is some data to say, maybe if it's a limited number of areas, we should treat those bones. We don't think that that cures patients, but we do think that it may prolong the effectiveness of whatever therapy they're on um, and maybe prevent more spread. Um, uh, if we don't see any uptake on these scans, if we don't see where the PSA is coming from, then we run a, a um, risk analysis um, a, a calculator to try and determine what is the chance that the PSA is coming from somewhere in the pelvis. Um, that, um, you know, oftentimes, even if we get something that says there's only a, you know, 30% chance that if we give you radiation, the PSA will be controlled in, in um, five, six years, we, we still offer radiation. So, um, but in that case, it's very much more a um, kind of actuarial analysis that goes into um, what is the likelihood that radiation might be useful. How effective is an MRI over biopsy in active surveillance mode in monitoring cancer growth? <laughs> um, an MRI is not more effective than a biopsy. And the MRI can help to direct a biopsy. Um, and so a lot of times you get the initial biopsy without an MRI. Um, and on a subsequent bi uh, before a subsequent biopsy, you get an MRI to see if there are any lesions in the prostate that can be targeted. Um, so just going back, um, might as well use this stuff while it's in front of me. Um, So if you see here, the ultrasound is going into the rectum and you know, the needle is going into the prostate. You know, just by virtue of the way access to the anatomy is, the needles go into the posterior part of the prostate. And the posterior part of the prostate is what is sampled. So we, we do miss cancers on biopsies, which are more anterior, um, and that is, often how an MRI is helpful um, um, to determine, you know, if there's a lesion that we should be um, paying more attention to. So that, hopefully that okay. answers the question. There's a group of questions asking between radiation therapy versus surgery for prostate cancer, which one preserves sexual function more than the other? In the short run, radiation. I mean, that's clear from quality of life studies. In the long run, three to five years after treatment, they're pretty comparable. If the prostate is not enlarged, but the PSA is elevated, what is the recommended course? Um, so I, I think that um, speaks to screening. So the, the PSA is elevated, the prostate's not enlarged. Um, you know, we can look at something called PSA density, how the PSA, how much PSA is being put out by the volume of the prostate essentially. Um, <clears throat> um, but you know, depending on the patient's age, um, their comorbidities, um, you know, their preferences for their health care, uh, work up with a biopsy uh, would be indicated. Now, if you have a patient that's 90 in very poor health, um, you know, demented, and has a very mildly elevated PSA, I'm not certain a biopsy would be um, of use in that particular patient. 
um, because we know that even in patients with high risk prostate cancer, it's unlikely to affect them if nothing is done to it in the next five years. Thank you, Dr. Nooner. We've come to the end of our webinar here. I Great. would like to suggest because of some of the questions that are still outstanding, you may want to visit Chesapeake Urology's YouTube page where there is a webinar recording from Dr. Melissa Mendez about Chesapeake Urology's prostate cancer recovery program. This speaks to exercises, nutrition, and other types of questions of that nature that I see have been presented here by some of our uh, registrants. So we'd like to thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar and for your great questions. You will receive a follow-up email with a link to this program. You may also be interested in visiting Chesapeake Urology's YouTube channel where you can find a full catalog of informational videos and webinar recordings. Dr. Nooner is available for in-office and telehealth appointments. He sees patients in our Quarry Lake, Baltimore office. For more information or to make an appointment, please visit ChesapeakeUrology.com, where self-appointment scheduling is now available. Thank you again for joining us and have a great evening. Thank you.